All right. Hey, everyone. How many of you out there have kids? Oh, that's a lot of people. All right, I have kids. I have two kids. They're four years old and six years old, and I really love spending time with them. They're really cool to play around with and to see what they come up with. They're a little bit nutty sometimes. And even if you didn't raise your hand and you don't have kids, I'm sure you're familiar, familiar with this idea that kids have a lot of imagination. They can take stuff and they can create things out of anything. So my kids, they'll take popsicle sticks and they'll start sword pointing. Those swords soon become catapults and they're flinging stuff at each other, right? They take a cardboard box and they make a racetrack. And on a rainy day, that cardboard box becomes a fort that they're playing in. I believe we all have some creativity in us, even from an early age. Maybe I should say, especially from an early age. Here's one of the things that I have a fear about, though. I have a fear that my kids, as they go through the school system, are going to lose some of their creativity. I think that our school system doesn't necessarily foster creativity. Back in 2006, Sir Ken Robinson gave this great TED Talk. And he was talking about creativity in our education systems. One of the things that he said was, we are educating people out of their creative capacities. I agree with that statement. I think it's a problem. I think this is a problem, especially in science and engineering education. I want to give you a little bit more detail and some illustrations as to why I think this is a problem. And I'm going to use biotechnology to give those illustrations. Why biotechnology? I think that biotechnology has the potential to address a lot of the problems that we have as a society. Biotechnology can address I issues if you're interested in world hunger. We can engineer crops to increase crop yields. Or, even from the foods that we produce, we can add nutrient value to things that we produce. We can add vitamins and antioxidants and other things like that to anything we produce. So if I bake a loaf of bread, I can add more vitamins into that by engineering the yeast. Or I can add, add antioxidants, like lycopene, that is shown here in these engineered bacteria. So if you look at these colonies, if you squirt, squint really close, you might see a tomato there. We can also address environmental issues, such as the hundreds of millions of tons of plastic that are floating in the ocean gyres around the world. We can engineer organisms to degrade that plastic, or we can go a step further. We could make organisms that would make a bioplastic something that's not petroleum-based that is truly biodegradable. How about health issues? Organisms have been used for a long time to, to make antibiotics. We can go a step further and, and find new medicinals. So for example, what if we take a simple sugar like glucose, engineer an organism, and we can make an anti-malarial compound such as artemisinin? With these illustrations, you might be thinking right now, hey, biotechnology sounds like it's doing a great job of innovation. There must be some creative people out there that are, that are coming up with all this stuff. The truth is, creativity is a bottleneck in biotechnology. OK, so I'm a university professor, and you guys are probably thinking right now, OK, if creativity is a bottleneck, the next thing he's probably going to say is, we need more research. No, that's not what I'm going to say. Research is part of the problem. We do need research. It's part of the solution, but it is part of the problem. One of the reasons why it's part of the problem is research does not equal creativity. You can think about that and talk about it and discuss it all you want, but here's one way of putting it. By the time you're actually doing research, you've probably had all of your creativity sucked out of you by the education system, right? What I actually want to talk about is a root cause problem. I want to talk about this trade-off between knowledge and creativity. Yes, I'm not an artist, so I promise this is the only hand-drawn illustration that I'm using. Okay. But I want to talk about knowledge and creativity and how we can use those two aspects to address real-world world problems. We need them both. Like I said, my kids are four and six years old, and they're creative. I do not expect them right now to be solving world problems. They have the creativity side, but they don't have the knowledge component. right? But at the same time, I expect them to be able to express their creativity. So if they're going to go and they're going to build a cardboard fort, I don't tell them they can't build that fort because they don't have a degree in architecture. What do I do? I feed them the knowledge that they need on demand as they're doing things, and I use the knowledge that they need to foster their creativity, to support their creativity. 
One of the problems that we have in our education system right now is it's skewed the other way. It's skewed towards the knowledge side of things. Let's give an example of what this, what this looks like in a typical system. So take a biology um, field of study, for example. If you were going to be a biologist, you would go through and you'd start taking some classes. You'd take intro bio classes, you'd learn vocabulary, you'd learn concepts. And those concepts tell you about DNA, they tell you about genes, about function, how about all these things interact. And then you go through and you start to implement these things in a lab setting. Um, microscope, please. And a typical experiment, if you're working with bacteria, you might see something like this, where you could go through and all those concepts and vocabulary that you learned in a classroom setting, you can translate it where you're doing something where you can see bacteria here. You can figure out specific genes, how they're turned on and off, so blue versus white colonies that you see here. Or you might do something where you can figure out, how can I take a function and move it into another organism? So I could take red fluorescence protein and put it into a bacteria, and now you have red colonies up here. That might be something that you would do in a biological setting. Back to the slides, please. One of the problems with that is you're actually reproducing known knowledge, known methodologies. You're coming and trying to reproduce something that is a known entity. It's not an open-ended problem. It's not fostering creativity. It's emphasizing knowledge. After you finish that, finish that test, after you finish a pass a practicum, after you've completed your courses, you graduate, and you're a biologist. Do we, do we do this in other fields? Is an artist an artist because they've taken drawing, sculpture, and painting classes? No. They're an artist because they do art. They create art. We don't take the same approach in science and engineering. So let's think back about the artist, or even thinking back to, let's say, my kids. We have a craft table back at our house. So what do we do? We provide stuff for them. We provide materials. We provide paint. Popsicle sticks, you know, that they're sword fighting with. And other materials that they can actually explore with. So we give them materials, and we also give them space. So the table itself, we give them time. They can explore, they can do different things. There's no right or wrong to any of that. There's no successful outcome to any of that. They can try things. If it doesn't look great, they can try again. They're free to explore, and they're free to, to create. So we need these two things, materials and intellectual space or intellectual time. And we need these in science and engineering too. In biotechnology, we're fortunate because we're making progress in terms of the material side of things. We're starting to compile a lot of knowledge. This goes back to that knowledge side of the equation again. We're starting to compile a lot of knowledge in terms of what specific DNA sequences have specific function. So that's, a, that's the left-hand side of what you're looking at. We have databases of knowledge. Knowledge isn't the, the, the hindering block right now. We can also get any of those components and actually physically receive them. So you actually have these pieces and you can play with them, you can tinker with them. From a process standpoint, this is some of the material that you start with and you can actually do this very easily. From a process standpoint, you can go from something where you have a concept. I could stand here right now and tell you and think about something that I want to be able to do, and I could write it down in terms of a genetic code. I could electronically send that off to a DNA synthesis company where they will make it physically, send it back to me, and in the order of two weeks and about $1,000, I can go from concept of what I just thought of right here on the stage to actually having an engineered organism in my hand, two weeks and about $1,000. This is roughly the equivalent of saying we have a biological printing press. We can write whatever we want. What we need is we need people who know what to say or want to write something. That's the bottleneck right now. So what would this look like to practically implement this? How could we actually foster creativity in this context? Ideally, you would have something that's purely open-ended, like a tinkering lab, where somebody could just go in there, there's materials, they could play, they could do whatever they wanted to. They could explore creatively, there's no successful outcome, they can fail if they want to. If it doesn't work out, that's hard to implement. That's hard to do from a practical standpoint when you start talking about biotechnology. What I'd like to propose is maybe there's another way that we can do this. Maybe we can turn around our educational paradigm. Instead of using knowledge as an endpoint, can we actually use knowledge as a starting point for something else? 
that something else being creativity. Remember, right now, a knowledge as an endpoint, we're testing people, we're passing classes, we're doing that type of thing, and then that's it. That shouldn't be it. So let me give you two illustrations of what this could look like. The first is borrowing something from marine biology. If you guys have ever been to one of the oceans and seen this phenomenon where the waves glow, it's really cool. It looks something like this. You have waves, and as they crest, they start to glow. From a knowledge standpoint, it would be really interesting to study that, to see why do the waves glow. There's phytoplankton in there. The shear stress as the wave crests causes a reaction in the phytoplankton makes them glow. That's knowledge. It's important. We need to figure out how that happens. After we figure out how that happens, what if we take that knowledge and we turn it around and make something creative out of it? So what if I take that mechanism that senses shear stress, and what if I take that bioluminescent component and I put it into a yeast? If I put it into that yeast and use that yeast to brew a beer, for example, what will happen? I open that bottle of beer, I pour it out. The shear stress as the beer is pouring out of the bottle causes the beer to glow. Now you have glowing beer. So for all of you, who are, all of you out there who are having extended St. Patty's Day party, glowing beer for you. <laughs> right? Let's take another example. Photosynthesis. It's undoubtedly an important process. We have to know the basics of it. We have to know the knowledge side of it. How does a plant cell sense light, take that photon of energy, and transmit it through the rest of the cell to do a whole bunch of different things? Yes, we need to know that. But can that be a starting point for other things? If I take the, the light sensing component of a cell, of a plant cell, and I take, figure out how to transduce that, can I move it into a bacteria? Um, can you switch to the mic back to the microscope again, please? And if we do that, can I take can I take and modify a bacterium so that it senses light and I can get it to do something else? Maybe that something else is changing color or producing a pigment. And if I do that, what we can have here is something that might look like this. Bacteria, it sense light and produce a pigment change. What is that? Those are bacteria that you're looking at up there. What are they acting as? Film, a film negative. They sense light, and you have the outline of Virginia. These bacteria were listening to Ed Ayers talk earlier, and they're really happy to be here in Virginia <laughs> for the TEDx talk. So what we're talking about is we need creativity in science and engineering education. It'll produce new and diverse ideas to solve a lot of the problems that we're interested in solving. The problem is our education system doesn't necessarily foster that. So the, thing, the challenge that we have is, can on the one hand still retain the knowledge component and teach it, but can we also foster creativity at the same time? Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. It's awesome. So, excellent, nicely done. So just one question, we have a lot, I'm sure that's, a, that's really, you, you bring up a lot of points. The thing that I think about is, you make the case for this beautifully. Mm -hmm. Creativity inside of science and, and, and math. Science and? Math and engineering. And engineering. Yep. Yep. And the part that I kind of think about when I think about kind of working through, an obs th working through a good issue or a good intention like that mm -hmm. is what's the single biggest precedent or historical baggage that's in the way of that happening? Uh, <laughs> um, to me, I think the biggest thing is most of the time we get cut off with trying to convey knowledge because for a lot of, for most intents and purposes, you need that knowledge as a starting point for other things. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times we're constrained and we don't have enough time to cover all the knowledge that we think people need. Hmm. But as you guys know out there, I mean, there's knowledge everywhere, right? I mean, the internet, there's knowledge. And you can teach that easily. Yeah. And people learn that on their own. So the paradigm has to shift because that's not sufficient anymore. Right. You have to take it a step further. Beautifully right. done. Thank you, Dr. Stephen Fong.